Well, good morning, and thank you, Nancy, for bringing us into worship this morning. Welcome to Hope Community Baptist Church. We are so happy to have you here with us. When you arrived, hopefully you received a program on your way in. I would like to go through just a couple announcements with you. A couple meaning quite a lot, actually. So follow along with me if you would. My dear brother, Eric Misselt, it's about 10 years now that we've met together and prayed together and encouraged each other. Uh, would you give a Hope Church welcome to our brother Eric Misselt as he gives us heaven today? Thank you, Eric. God bless you. Thanks for coming. So I know what you're all thinking this morning. You're wondering, what is the bass player doing up here? And um, that's a good question. My name's Eric and I'm a member here at Hope Community Church. Um, I preach here every so often uh, for several years, and this morning, Pastor George gets a break. So I wanna give a welcome to guests, especially first time or returning guests. We are really glad you're here with us to this morning. This is a very, very good day to visit with us because the title of this message is, What's Next? Now, one of my favorite TV shows, one of the main characters, keeps asking the question, what's next? The idea for the character is that to keep moving on to the next thing, the next demand, the next challenge to move out of the past, through the present and into the future, what's next? Now, I like this phrase because I want to know what's next. What's gonna happen next, don't you? I want to get reliable information about the future. I want to be able to plan for that future. I want to do things now that will help me be aligned with what is coming because the future, even though it's based on the past, will not be the past. The future will be different and it will be new. We should all be interested in 
what's next. Uh, let me come at this from a different angle. Back when I was just a youngin, <clears throat> there was a very popular folk country singer named John Denver. And one of his songs had the tagline, Almost Heaven, West Virginia. And the sentiment was that the singer longed for the, mat the natural beauty, the way of life, the uh, people of his home in the hill country of that state, the mountains, the rivers, the country roads. This is a constant theme in music and poetry, isn't it? Right? Everything from Leonard Skinner's Sweet Home Alabama back to Beethoven's The Pastoral Symphony, all the way up to John Lennon's Imagine, even U2's Where the Streets Have No Name, they all speak to a longing for a different and a better place, a place that we are not in right now. And it seems to me that a lot of us have had that same reaction in our own lives, haven't we? Do you ever get the sense that things, well, they're just not right in this world? That places, people, and society just doesn't work well? They are broken somehow. Maybe it's because all the pieces are not quite there. Maybe the pieces are there, but they don't fit right. It seems to me that this is what's happening around us right now. That is the nature of our reality in this world. But we need to live with heaven in view. It is said that we must begin with the end in view. So I'm going to talk to the believers about heaven today. Still, even Christians get it wrong. It's remarkable how stories of people who have died and been resuscitated and then claim to remember their near-death experience carry more weight than the actual text of the Bible. We've been influenced by movies, bad preaching, and pagan philosophies to a view of heaven which just doesn't line up with the text of Scripture. But the Bible does give us solid information about heaven. It turns out that Christians are not going to spend eternity in some spiritual dimension where we'll have wings. That's not the picture in the Bible at all. Sure, God gives us information and he doesn't tell us everything. But it turns out that's kind of fun. It's kind of like God is telling us, you've got this great present coming. I'm so excited for you. I don't want to spoil the surprise, but here are a few hints. And that's what we're getting when we hear the descriptions of heaven. So we're going to talk some about these things that we do know about heaven. What is heaven now? What is heaven to come? When Christians talk about their eternal state, what we generally call heaven, what is that all about? We're all curious about the future. I'm going to be spending the rest of my life in the future. I want to be prepared, don't you? What I'm referring to is the end game, the final chapter, the ultimate goal, our eternal state. Basically, what we have come to call heaven. And I'm going to give you a little hint. Heaven is a wonderful place. Now, back when I was a kid in youth group, we used to sing a little round um, in one of our youth groups. Several of you all did the same thing, and you all know the words. It goes kind of like this. Heaven is a wonderful place. Sing along. Filled with glory and grace. I'm going to sing my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. I want to go there. And then the girls would come in. Heaven is a wonderful place. There we go. Him with glory and grace. I'm going to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. I want to be there. Isn't that great? Good job, guys. Thank you, Cassie. Now, that's a very fun song, and it has some helpful thoughts. Chief among them is that heaven is, in fact, a wonderful place. You want to be there. But we have some questions. Is heaven real? Will heaven be a good thing? Will I enjoy it? What will it be like? Just to let you know, um, my sources are many, but I'm especially indebted to this one book by uh, Randy Alcorn called Heaven, which was helpful to me in understanding what's next and I do recommend it for your further study. So we have some questions to answer. Uh, and we may have more questions coming out of this morning than we had coming in. And especially that we're able to get answered this morning. But before we get too 
far into the future this morning, I want to get into the text. Let's look at the Bible and see what it says. It seems to me to start in Revelation chapter 21. Remember, start with the end in view. And we're going to start in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. This passage begins our understanding of the heaven to come. That's right. There is a heaven to come, which is not the heaven that exists now. There will be a new heaven. Just as there is a new earth, and that earth that exists today will go away, the first heaven, the heaven that exists now, will go away. So our culture already has notions about the end of the current world and the new one that will replace it, right? There's the old earth, there's a new earth. That's a very familiar concept to many people. But old heaven and new heaven, what does that mean? It seems to me to untangle our notions of heaven, we need to grapple with that question. If there's going to be a new heaven, then there is now a current, someday will be gone, old heaven. That old heaven exists right now, and friends, that's the source of confusion about, actually a lot of confusion about heaven. We think that our eternal state will be in the heaven that exists now. But the text tells us that this heaven, this version of heaven, is not the one that we will spend the rest of time in when that time comes. So everybody tracking with me? Okay. The heaven that we know about now will not be the heaven that we will spend eternity in. This heaven is the old heaven, and we will spend eternity in the new heaven. So when we say that we go and die, we go to the current heaven when we die, that is not where we're going to spend the rest of time. So my guess is, <clears throat> you already have some questions. For one, what is exactly heaven? What does that mean? That's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that question. I don't have a great answer. But there is some information. In his letter to his friends in the city of Corinth, Paul talks about being caught up in a vision or an interdimensional transport beam or something in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he refers to his coming into the presence of God in the third heaven. Now, what's the first question that comes to your mind when I say that? Third heaven, what do you mean? There are three heavens? What's that? Yes, in a way there are. Let me tell you about each one of them. The word heaven can refer to three things. First, heaven is what we would call the sky. That's where the winds blow and the birds fly. That's the first heaven. The second heaven is what we would call space. You know, the final frontier where the moon, the planets, the sun, the stars, the galaxies all are. And then the third heaven is above all that. It is where God is. Now, not only is this a very poetic way of saying that God is above the physical creation, but it also is a way to capture an idea that is hard to express. That God is not part of the physical creation. God lives in some other place. A non-physical place. This word heaven, as used by the Bible, can refer to these three things. Sky, space, and where God is. And this morning we're not talking about meteorology or the weather. We're not interested in rocket science. We're going to talk about the third heaven. Everybody with me? Good. I'm going to offer a working definition of the word heaven. Heaven is where God dwells. Where God dwells. That's my general definition of heaven. So as we read in the first book of the Bible that God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, there was a little part of heaven in the garden. When we read that God was present in the giant worship tent for the Jews and then later in the temple, that place, the Holy of Holies, was, to paraphrase, a little slice of heaven on earth. Why? Because that's where God was. That's where God dwells. Right now, God dwells in a, well, human words kind of fail us, but he, he dwells in a spiritual dimension, which is the closest I can get to. 
some place where angels, cherubim, people in their intermediate states, and Jesus in his resurrected body can exist with God. Now, I don't have much more specific information than that, except for this one insight. Think about this. If the Holy Spirit, who is God, indwells us Christians, then, get this, there's a little bit of heaven in us Christians right now. God is in us. We are receptacles, or a kind of heaven. Pretty cool, right? So, at this point in history, that is what heaven is about. It doesn't seem to be wholly physical at all, and I can't point to it either on this earth or up in, this, in space. I wish I could tell you more, but there just isn't really a lot more that we're told. So, that's what heaven is like at this point in time. But our focus is on the heaven to come. Again, to help orient us, God creates the heavens and the earth, right? That's the first sentence of the Bible. And notice that the heavens, there is plural, right? The three heavens. There's light and there's time and the separation of the waters in the first heaven, the sky. The water clouds are separated from the surface water, right? That's the sky. And then land, plants, and the second heaven becomes visible, right? Space. Water creatures, bird creatures, land creatures, and then lots and lots and lots of trees. God creates humans, lives in relationship with them, and then humans mess things up badly. The whole story of the Bible is focused on how God slowly pieces together our broken relationship. And the linchpin of this whole story that we find ourselves in is Jesus. Jesus is born. He lives. He teaches. He heals. And he remakes our relationship with God. Jesus comes as the ultimate king. Everything about Jesus is immediately good news or turns out to be good news. We, all of us today, are living in the Jesus good news time of history. Even though a lot of the world hasn't got the memo or more accurately has chosen to ignore the memo. That is our past, our present is what the theologians call the church age. Much of the life we live in today is merely the advancement of the society, culture, and government that was strongly connected to the world that Jesus actually came into. But there is a difference. Jesus was here, and he still is. In the supernatural influence, motivation, and direction that exists in his followers, the authentic church. But right now, the earth looks pretty much like it did in the past. And if we could see it, we would see that heaven today looks pretty much like it did in the past. And that's the current situation with heaven and earth. So, what about our future? What's next? Well, personally, we will all likely die physically. Glad I could cheer you up this morning. Afterwards, if we are authentic followers of Jesus, we will be with Jesus. Now, in the big moments of history, we still have, in my best understanding today, the tribulation, the second coming of Jesus, the millennium, and finally the eternal state. Now, you may quibble with me about those future historical events, but we're not going to argue about right, the fact that when believers die, they go to heaven, right? We're not going to argue about that part. After I, and as I said, this is usually what we think of as eternal life in heaven. So, now, let's go back to Revelation chapter 21 and see what the new heaven will be like. The second verse starts out this way. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. So here the stage is set. A new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem that comes to that new earth out of the new heaven. Are you tracking with all of that? Okay. All right, let's go on. Verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Well, this is a big deal. God will at some time in the future, permanently dwell with humanity. Very cool, right? 
Okay, do you get it? Do you see it? God will dwell with man. Heaven will be on earth. The great divide between heaven where God is and earth where humanity is will be healed. It will be unified. It will be conjoined. This is what the new heaven and new earth will be like. They will be together. That's what's new. There will not be the profound separation between heaven and earth that exists now. The relationship between the two, heaven and earth, will be different. They will be each new and different, and their relationship will be new and different. Do you, do you see that? Do you get that? Okay, let's, let's move on. Let's go on to verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Now, to answer Eric Clapton, yes, there will be tears in heaven. But God will wipe them away. And there will be something very satisfying about that resolution. Because we will no longer mourn or weep. And we will no longer toil, which is actually the word behind the word that's translated pain here. We will no longer toil. It, which helps us to understand that we will likely work in our eternal state, but it won't be painful. Some of you have never known what that's like. For some of you, work has always been joyless, awful, toil. The new heaven-earth situation will not be like the work you know now. Work in the new heaven will be fun, joyful, and fulfilling. That right there is enough for some of you to just sign up immediately. But wait, there's more. Verse 5. He who is seated, seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Hold on. God makes things new. What does that mean, new? You think you know what that word means, but it's important that you understand how the Bible uses that word. And we got a hint of that before. It's not completely different. That's not what the Bible means by new. The Bible usually uses the word new to mean renovated and different, based on something that had existed before. And we're kind of familiar with that idea. Um, back in the day, Procter & Gamble, every six months or so, would do something, they'd tweak the formula or the package or something of Tide detergent so that they could claim that it was new, right? They could label Tide, new Tide, you know, with sparkly crystals or something, right? In the world of marketing, new became a cynical manipulation of our wallets. But don't get turned off by that idea. There is value in understanding this sense of the word new. So let's look at how the Bible uses the word new. Jesus gave us a new commandment, right? Love one another just as I have loved you. But that didn't come out of thin air. That was based off of the Old Testament commandments regarding loving your neighbor, right? The Apostle Paul refers to a new lump of leaven. And the leaven is always based on the old bread, isn't it? God is in the new business. And now you theologians out there, you'll appreciate this. The new covenant in Jeremiah 31 is based on the existing relationship with God, but profoundly improved. When Jesus saves us, he makes us into new creatures, and the new us is based on the old us. Even our post-death, resurrected, glorified bodies are based on our old existence in 1 Corinthians 15. The new man of Ephesians, chapter 2, is based on the old man of Jew and Gentile. See, when God makes things new, he does so using the old. The new heaven and the new earth will be based on the old, but will also be different and much, much better. So the current heaven and earth are not going to endure, but they're going to become the basis for something much better. See that? And that's where our eternal life is going to be. The new heaven is going to be really something wonderful. You will want to be there. Now this is where you're going to start 
pressing back and asking some specific questions. I'm going to try and anticipate a couple of those questions and answer them briefly. First question, what will I be like? Well, you will be better. Next question. No, seriously. The question about, our, uh, about this, this question is actually about the theological idea of our glorification, which may seem like an odd term if you're visiting with us today. It is the recognition of other Bible teaching that after we die, we will be given new physical bodies based on our former bodies, just as I mentioned that idea, which will be much, much better. Now, I admit there isn't a great deal of clarity about this point, but it seems like all of our broken genetics and bad habits will be fixed. Have you ever been to a high school reunion? I have been lucky enough to be at all of my 10-year reunions. I can remember one incident vividly. This gal suddenly came up to me like we were old friends, and I didn't recognize her. She had changed physically and not for the better. Now, once she introduced herself, I could tell, oh, sure, it's, you know, she was different, but based on the gal who I had known years earlier. But it was an awkward moment. What if you didn't have those awkward moments because your old friend no longer looked as good as they did? What if the moment was one of joy and celebration because you said, Sure, this is what this guy should have looked like all along. That would be a great moment. So the basic answer is, we will be us, but better. Get it? Okay. Now let's just make an observation. If in heaven we will become us, but better, is it possible that in hell we are us, but worse, much worse? Just something I wonder about. Okay, that's a simple answer to the question, what will I be like, okay? Here's the next question, what will I be doing? Now, this is actually one of my favorite um, questions I have about the new heaven, because I hate all the traditional answers, okay? All the traditional answers are great for mega church worship leaders. You know, we'll be playing heavenly instruments and singing, worshiping Jesus forever and ever, repeating praise choruses on and on and on and on and on and on and on. I'm sorry, just not appealing to me. And that's not because I don't want to worship Jesus, okay? It's because that description is limited and a narrow understanding of worship. There is more, there is a more biblical response to the question of what we'll be doing Here's what we do know. We do know that we will rule and reign with Christ. Now, it's, com- it's not completely clear what that means, but here are some thoughts. I will remind you that God created humanity with the original purpose of ruling the earth. That's in Genesis 1. We still, to this day, have that responsibility to govern and keep this world, and we have not done a very good job. But what if we could? What if we were freed from our dysfunction and our brokenness to do the things that God always wanted us to do? What would that look like? Yeah, I don't know either. But there is something that is deep within me that really, really wants a crack at doing that. What if rather than hunting animals for blood sport, we wrestled with lions, tried to outrun jackrabbits, swam with the tuna, and tried to outlift elephants instead? What if we could delve deep into the workings of creation and find energy that did not disrupt, destroy, or pollute? What if instead of ruling and reigning for dysfunctional conquest and our neediness, We instead ruled and reigned with Christ in grace and truth. What if? There is something about being a fully functioning human being that, seems to me, becomes a wholehearted, whole person worship of God. That, friends, seems to me, is much of what our everlasting lives will be like. Imagine, if you will, spending eons developing a skill, 
learning about a specific mystery of creation, having time to engage in deep and intimate conversations with wonderful people. I had just had the sense that there will be some great coffee shops on the new heaven earth to sit and enjoy your friends, both old and new. Let me sum this up with a thought. Whatever you really enjoy doing in this life and place will be pale, colorless, and empty compared to this corresponding thing in the new heaven slash earth. What will we be doing? I'm not sure, but it will be wonderful. So, there's just a couple of common questions and brief answers about heaven that seem to come up for a lot of people. There are a lot more questions, of course, but I want to encourage you to all study this for yourselves. But the big idea is this. Know what's next. Be aware of your eternal life to come and prepare now for your time then. We have what the Bible calls a great inheritance coming. Let's spend some time and some energy getting to know what will we be getting. So let me review what we know. We know that there's a current heaven and earth. They are separated from each other. There will be new versions of both, and they will be very tightly intertwined with each other. The new heaven-earth will be based on the old versions, but much, much better. The things that are broken will be fixed. This world will work right. We who are broken, we will be fixed. We will work right. Okay, and then one last observation. There's a lot about the new heaven and earth that I didn't get to talk about this morning, which is appropriate because of the great things that will occupy our existence in eternity. But let me say the obvious about the new heaven and earth, you will want to be there. So I hope you found all this information interesting and see how it relates to the text of Scripture. But we have higher aspirations than being merely interesting. We want to change our lives. So what can we do about our knowledge of the new heaven and earth? Well, I'm going to restate the obvious. You should be there. But then, of course, you're going to ask the question, well, how? Well, heaven is where God is, right? And how do we as broken, dysfunctional human beings coexist with a perfect and holy God? And the answer is not very well on our own. We need help. In fact, the Bible makes the case repeatedly that there's nothing that we can do to fix the broken relationship that we have with God. There is only one fix, and that is Jesus. Jesus himself said that there's only one way to God, and that is through Jesus himself. No one goes to the Father except through me. If you have not yet done so, you need to come to Jesus. And we here at Hope Community Church want to do whatever we can to clear the path for you to meet and engage with Jesus. If you came here today with friends or family, talk with them about what is your next steps to God. What does that look like? If you're here on your own, Pastor George or myself would be happy to chat with you afterwards. Okay? Still, there are a lot of Jesus followers already in the room. What is your next best step in light of the new heaven and earth? Well, you're thinking, I'm already headed there, so I'm good, right? Well, sure, you're not wrong, but... You also have a responsibility, Jesus follower, to encourage others to follow your example of following Jesus. Heaven is a wonderful place. You want to go there, but you have a responsibility to help sign up others to go there as well. Everlasting life in heaven is a good thing. It is good news. It is part of the gospel. We should tell people that. Tell people the good news about Jesus. This is one of the first things that believers can do with this information about heaven. Okay? Here's another thing. Remember that I said we should study and learn about our inheritance? This is key. We need to reorient our lives in light of eternity. Let me say that again. We need to reorient our lives in light of eternity. Many of us focus on rather short-term goals, things like what you want to do in five years, retirement in 10 or 20 years. You youngins out there, you pat yourself on the backs if you're vaguely aware of where you want to be in 50 years. <laughs> Rookies, bush leaguers. To quote the song, when we have been there 10,000 years, we will barely be aware that time has passed. 
having an eternal perspective. That's the lesson for us this morning. Quit wasting your life on the junk and status of this world. Quit wasting your life. Seriously, some of you claim to follow Jesus, uh, but you're investing huge amounts of time and effort making yourself comfortable in this world. I don't mean that living in Sterling Heights or Shelby is sinful, but I do mean that there is an issue for some of you that you're just not satisfied with your life, so you try to make it better. Well, of course you're not satisfied. You won't be truly satisfied until you, or content, until you are in the new heaven and new earth. That's where your satisfaction and contentment will be. So why are you so working so picking hard to become satisfied in this world? Stop it. You're just being silly. Stop being silly. It's seriously time for you to develop a truly eternal perspective. Otherwise, you are squandering your life. Don't waste your life. Can I suggest something? As followers of Jesus who worship the true God, do I have to remind you that there are two agendas in front of us? There is an agenda of this world, and there's a heavenly agenda. Which agenda are you working on? It used to be a vague insult to say of someone, they are so heavenly minded that they are of no earthly good. You ever heard that before? And the implication was that someone was so spiritual that they ignored what was happening around them. Of course, ignoring what's going on around you is not a heavenly agenda at all. In fact, some of the most heavenly-minded Christians were profoundly affected by what was happening around them in this world. Saint Benedict, who founded the Benedictine Monastery Movement, mandated the moral obligation to care for the sick and created the first hospital in Europe. William Wilberforce, a card-carrying, heavenly-minded Christian, worked for decades to eradicate slavery from the United Kingdom. William King and Robert Rakes, serious Christian guides, began the Sunday School movement in Great Britain to bring literacy to uneducated children of the 18th century. Washington Gladden and Walter Rockenbuch, out of their deep conviction of the truth of the gospel of Jesus, worked out how that could be lived out among the poor and economically oppressed. Martin Luther King, as broken as the rest of us, yet recognizing God's agenda for this nation did not include racial segregation, worked to his death on a godly resistance to that blight on our national character. Charles Colson, because of his own criminal conviction and conversion to Jesus, worked to reform prisons and jails. And let's not forget the countless multitudes of Christians in PTAs, media, political, corporate, and academic environments who are working, occasionally succeeding, in trying to show a very stubborn world a touch of what heaven on earth could be like. When Jesus announced his public ministry in Luke chapter 4, he went to a local church, picked up a Bible, and he read this passage. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he told the church that he was there that morning to accomplish exactly those things. So can we, as his followers, join Jesus in doing those things? When we say... What would Jesus do? The answer from Jesus himself is different from merely being a good citizen who keeps their head down. It is different than checking off things from your bucket list. It is different than attending to your own comfort and safety. Being heavenly minded, seems to me, is also to work on the agenda of heaven here and now. There are things we can do and we should do. Why? Because heaven is coming to an earth near you. Let's try to clean up the place a little bit before our king arrives, shall we? Let's cooperate with the spirit a bit to invite others into Jesus' kingdom. Let's be the people of God in this place and time. That is the heavenly agenda for our earthly world. We can either cooperate with God's agenda for the world that he created, or we can resist that agenda. Christian, what seems better to you? Let's actually do what Jesus would do. 
If heaven is what's next, then let's get with the heavenly agenda that God has prepared for us right now. It's time for us to finish. Heaven is a wonderful place. You want to be there. You need to go there. But it's not some pagan, philosophical, abstract, interdimensional spirituality. It is concrete and real. If you're not headed there, you need to change direction now. If you are headed there, great. We will all be enriched because you are there. But your job is not just to separate from the world and just wait to die to get there. Our job is to work on heaven's agenda here and now. That is what Jesus did. That is what he expects us to do. So I'm going to leave you with a question. And it's very personal. For you, your real future, what's next? Let's pray. Can you say amen to that in your heart of hearts? If you're just, you've surveyed the cross today, it's wonderful. It's granting eternal life to us. We're living here with him, dwelling with him. We will, for, it's wonderful. I pray if you know that joy, you live in it, you love it, you love the Savior who's provided eternal life for you, and you commit to take as many of your family and friends and those you cross paths with into eternity with the Lord too. It's our mission, our commission. What a wonder of a Savior he is. If you need prayer today, if this wonder isn't really wonderful to you yet, We'd be honored to pray with you before you leave. Come on forward. We want you to know the wonder, experience the wonder. I mean, heaven on earth, dwelling with God today. We desire that for you. Would you come for prayer as others are heading off to classes? Please just come on forward. You may want to pray alone or pray with us. It'd be our great joy to pray with you because it is truly wonderful. Now let's be dismissed with the blessing of God in our lives. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship, even the friendship we can have with the Holy Spirit of God be yours today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. Live in his peace and joy and in his wonder. And gentlemen, see Mike Machurdo before you leave today. Have a great day.